At this time, I'm honored to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Nkiru Nawulezi. Dr. Nawulezi is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and affiliate faculty at Yale School of Public Health. She earned her doctorate degree in ecological community psychology at the Michigan State University, has additional certifications in college teaching, community engagement, and quantitative research methods. Her research examines the ecological factors that enhance equity within and across the domestic violence housing continuum. She also serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Family Violence and is on the editorial board of the Community Psychology and the Global Perspective Journal. She is also a research and evaluation advisor to multiple system change organizations, such as the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, DC Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. Please welcome Dr. Nawu Lazy. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna take a minute to just share my slides. All right, perfect. So one of the things I like to do before we get started is just, just make sure everybody can see the screen and everything looks good. So if you give me a thumbs up, that'd be really wonderful. I am absolutely thrilled to be here to talk with you about how we can create safer spaces in the healthcare system. It is such a wonderful opportunity for me to talk to you about a social issue that I feel is one of the most preventable social issues that we have today. It is really important that um, we are able to create, that every survivor in our country is able to go to any space to get the kind of support that they need and deserve to support their healing and well-being. So again, I appreciate you having me here. My pronouns, um, I forgot to say, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and I also wanna begin this lecture with an acknowledgement that I live and work on the lands of the Piscataway and Anacostian people, also known as Washington DC. And I honor them as the original stewards of this land. Um, I also want to give thanks to my enslaved ancestors whose bodies were exploited to build the social and economic structures of this city and many cities across the, um, across the country. I acknowledge that the colonization and white supremacy has the impact that those systems have had on this country. And I do a lot of my own work to ensure and understand that we can fulfill a commitment to our collective well-being and liberation. So I'm grateful to be here and I just wanna give honor to all of the things that make it possible for me to do so. Now you're at a lecture and I wanna make sure that this is as engaging as possible given um, that we're on Zoom. Um, and so what will you learn about today? My goal is that, cause really this could be a two day, three day, four day training. And in some ways, and in some instances it is. So I'm gonna do a broad sweep. Um, and I really decided to focus this, focus this lecture on skills that you can use when you're speaking with a survivor, okay? So I'll identify some components of domestic violence. I'll talk a little bit about how to effectively screen and assess for domestic violence. Hopefully um, it's easier than you think. And I also wanna talk about how to appropriately respond to survivors. And some of the things um, that recent literature has said would be really useful and supportive that we need to make sure we have in place when we come in contact with survivors. Does that sound good? I hope so. A little bit about me, because it's always important to know who's telling you the information that you're getting. I, um, again, have a PhD in community psychology. I identify as a community psychologist. And what this means is that I do a lot of work 
looking at the ways in which individuals are interacting with systems and how that influences their social, emotional, um, and material well being. I care very, very deeply about changing the material and social conditions that survivors are living within, right? Providing support resources and particularly engaging in community based participatory research in order to shift the systems that survivors are engaging with. Much of my work has been rooted in the housing system. Again, as I said, I live in Washington, D.C., and um, where rent is astronomical. And so if a survivor is trying to leave her partner or wants to establish financial security or independence, um, it can be very difficult to find a home um, at market rate. So I do a lot of work to try to create more affordable housing options for survivors in my city. Um, and I care a lot about that. I also work a lot with survivors who have histories of multiple marginal, marginalizations. So not just the stigmatization and marginalization of being a survivor. And what I mean by that is all of the stigma that's connected to having an experience where someone um, has created a world for you that is hard, um, how do I say this? created a world, has made, has engaged in ways to make your world smaller. So, and the ways in which survivors are blamed for that. So I do a lot of work with survivors who are homeless or unhoused, survivors who experience, um, who are living with addiction, survivors who might live with HIV, somewhat survivors who are trans, survivors who are queer. And so much of my work has looked at the intersections. How do we create systems that not only respond to the violence of, um, or having to experience violence, but also look at the intersections of what it means to hold other types of marginalized and stigmatized identities. Now, when we talk about violence, right? When we talk about violence, I, I'm specifically talking about, now domestic violence can be called a lot of different things. And I'm curious if you all wanna put in the chat what some words that you've heard. Um, oftentimes folks talk about domestic violence as intimate partner violence. That's really common in the domestic violence or in the academic world. Um, or they talk about family violence, or they talk about domestic abuse or abuse more broadly. Now, these are all really, relatively similar terms with some slight variations given based on who the perpetrator might be. But throughout this presentation, what I'm talking about is the pattern of behaviors that are intended to obtain and maintain control and power over another person. And I think it's really important that we pause and look at some of the key components of this particular definition. The idea that domestic violence is a pattern of behaviors, right? Things that happen, um, what, well, how do we identify patterns, right? Things that happen over, right, and over again. There's an understanding or underlying um, way of practicing or engaging in strategies that repeat themselves, okay? The single incident, a single incidences of violence um, can sometimes be difficult. If you're in a, a experience where you're trying to figure out with a with a survivor or with a person, like is this domestic violence? Is it not? One component or one thing you can always hold in the back of your head is what is the pattern of behavior? Now, if we think about patterns of behavior, it doesn't always have to be the same type of behavior. Right? And we'll talk about the different types of domestic violence in a minute. Um, but the pattern of behavior, when you look back over your charts, when you look back over your notes, if you're noticing, ah, there's something here about power, right? There's something here about this person being controlled in a particular way or um, not really having a lot of autonomy. Something is going on. Right, and something can go, go as the idea is that the, um, the thing that might be going on could be domestic violence. And so one of the things that um, I also wanna say is 
intimate, when we talk about domestic violence and specifically we're talking about the violence that is done by and from another intimate partner or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or um, a sexual partner or a dating partner, that's the kind of violence we're talking about or that's the, um, the person who's causing harm would be some kind of intimate partner someone that they're in close intimate relationship with, either currently or have been in the past. Now, the Center for Disease Control gives us a really nice behavioral-based definition of what domestic violence entails, what it includes, right? And I'm sure you might have some ideas, things that you have thought about, right? But I wanna say that it's important to think about power, domestic violence as and power as the container and the modalities, the things I'm about to describe to you as the ways in which abusive partners exercise power. So when you're trying to figure out, again, is this domestic violence? I'm not sure, it's a single incident of, of physical violence, but, and these are the types that we've learned about. Domestic violence can include physical violence, right? All of the ways in which um, a perpetrator or abusive partner or a person who is causing harm might slap a person or push a person or, or hit with a fist um, or get kicked or kick somebody or, or um, slam survivors up against something or choke them or strangle, strangle them. And these are the kinds of things that are more, they might cause more visible markings on the body um, they also, um, depending on the severity, could cause traumatic brain injuries. So this is the things that are some, and this physical violence category might also include if people are using weapons like, um, like knives or guns, right? These are the types of modalities um, where people who are causing harm are exercising physical violence in order to maintain power. Now, another way that we might be able to think about how can someone maintain control over somebody else's life, they can use sex and sexual violence. So rape, um, rape of an intimate partner, um, being made to coer coerce coercing a survivor into um, having sex or with them or somebody else, touching them in inappropriate ways, uh, making having unwanted sexual contact. contact these are types of ways in which um, abusive partners might control using sexual violence as a tool. Another way that we might use sexual violence as a tool is, or domestic violence as a tool is by stalking. Now, stalking is a really important one to identify because stalking is the harassment and the threats and the idea that someone that I just can't seem, this person seems to be everywhere I am, right? I had a survivor um, talk about how the abusive partner would come and park in front of her house every night and then follow her to work every single morning, right? And she couldn't tell her coworkers because she was afraid that she was gonna get fired, but she was terrified when she went to bed at night and woke up in the morning, even though she had put him out of the house before. So stalking is um, something that allows for, uh, some, stalking is something that creates a lot of fear inside of survivors, um, even if the person is not staying with them or in the home with them. We also can talk about psychological aggression as a tactic. Right? And this tactic is really, um, we're gonna break, psychological aggression is broken down into two pieces. The first is expressive aggression. And you can imagine it is the calling you names, insulting you, saying that you are putting you down in a way to um, degrade your self-esteem, who you are, how you are. Um, and then coercive control is another component of psychological aggression. Right, And the idea is that I am trying to do things as an abusive partner that is that monitors you, that threatens you. I'm doing, it could be really insidious, insidious things as well. I never say that ever. Insidious things as well, right? Doing tactics or engaging in tactics that um, are limiting your choices about how you move through the world. Um, 
very specifically. And I might not necessarily physically touch you, but the words that I'm saying, how I'm creating your environment, the idea is that you have very few options and you are forced to move in a way um, that I intend for you to move. Now, the other one that the CDC talks about um, or that the CDC has documents is this control over reproductive and sexual health. So a survivor oftentimes who is experiencing this type of violence um, or has a partner who is using this type of violence in order to control them, this survivor is not gonna have an opportunity um, to control how often um, they might get pregnant, um, might not have an opportunity to control when or how, um, how many times, right? There's also can be, and this might be um, abusive partners messing with birth control or, and I'm sure you might have other examples for those of you in the field who are pretty familiar with the ways in which there's interference to reproductive health. Um, and then the CDC, I'm gonna introduce another one that the CD, another type of domestic violence that the CDC does not actually measure right now. I assume that they will in the future. And that is, Financial, financial abuse. Um, what we know is that if there are signs of physical violence, um, sexual violence or other kind of psychological aggression or emotional abuse, the idea of financial abuse is probably right up there with it. And so I include this because this might be something you wanna look out for. If the person is saying they don't get to control their money, um, if the person is saying, if survivor is saying that um, somebody else controls the bills, um, sometimes it's refusing to pay the bills. So keeping the survivor um, having to bring in and be responsible to be the primary um, bread maker and the breadwinner in the house and not sharing responsibility or uh, putting survivors on the budget and uh, sabotaging their ability to work and gain financial independence. It could be abusive partners running up credit cards, um, opening up, using the social security number to open up um, accounts in their name and the survivor's name against their will, refusing to pay rent, right? This happens a lot uh, here in the city. Many abusive partners might um, refuse to, might, might not be paying the rent and then leave and end up, survivors end up in an eviction notice that they didn't know was coming. So there's lots of ways in which the ability to maintain and have control over your financial life is thwarted through abuse. Now, I just gave you a lot of examples about the types of violence. And I think that sometimes it is important to know that um, there are as many ways to harm someone as there are like things that we have control over. So because of that, I learned um, from colleagues at, a North, at the Northwest Network for bisexual, trans, lesbian, and gay survivors of abuse that one way to assess how, assess who's a victim, who's a perpetrator, what's going on is whose world is getting smaller, right? When you are trying to look at and you're speaking to survivors, the intention of an abusive partner is again to re reduce and remove power. So who is the most isolated in this incidence? Are there things that you're seeing that would actually make the survivor have less access to resources that they might need, right? Less access to money, less access to friends, less in, social, in their social network. Are they more isolated? Having less access to um, housing and being able to move freely, having less access to medication, right? Are there things that you are noticing as they're talking to you that they would, that would make their world smaller, this practice, this thing that's happening? Um, so whose world is getting smaller versus whose world is expanding or getting bigger. Now, another thing that becomes really important is language when we think about domestic violence, right? Because I just told you there's about four different ways that people talk about domestic violence in the world. And sometimes people refer to domestic violence as from the types and modalities and behavior, right? So um, the term that I'm going to use in this presentation is survivors. 
Now, survivors is a term that is often used in the domestic violence field because it was back in, I can give you a, a quick history, um, but back in eight, 1989, in the late, 90, late 80s, um, there was a large study that was done that was in response to the idea that survivors, this learned helplessness idea, and maybe you all know about this, right? So at the, the, at the time, the common idea was that survivors were giving in to violence or acquiescing to violence and therefore, um, weren't necessarily, um, yeah, were kind of weak and small and weren't doing the, weren't engaged in ways, um, weren't actively engaged in their relationship in ways that would keep themselves safe. And so in the late 80, late 80s, um, Gandalf, this, this Gandalf and um, I forget the second author's name, created a large study where they looked at how often survivors, it's really challenged this idea of learned helplessness. And what they learned is that survivors were actually extremely active, extremely active and trying to keep themselves safe while they were in their relationship. They were actively seeking out support. They were actively reaching out to people. And it really debunked this myth that things, um, that people who were inside of violent relationships were just like giving into the violence. So, what this means is that survivors is a term and they call this a survivor theory. So we use this to really speak about when we call somebody a survivor, what we're saying is that we honor your agency, right? We think that this restores agency. It centers that survivors do have um, the ability to access power and we can, and that they do a lot of things to ensure, to survive and to stay safe, whether they're in their relationship or not. And so survivors is a, is a way to honor that agency inside inside. Another term that's used is victims. Um, and this term is primarily, I would say, a legal term, even though we do use it in the civil and legal systems. Um, this term is oftentimes used to identify the person with whom the experience has happened to. Um, and so I use it less. Um, and you are welcome to use a more antiquated term is battered woman. Um, some people still use it. Some people still talk about domestic violence as battering, but you can imagine that this particular term focuses a lot on the physical aspect or the physical type of domestic violence. And as you can see, domestic violence is a very complex, a complex experience. And so by just referring to domestic violence as battering, we um, limit the scope and understanding and complexity of what domestic violence is. Also the term woman, right? Not that there are some very um, gendered language and understanding, but not everyone. There's a lot of survivors who don't identify as women. Um, and we can talk a little bit about gender and dyna gender dynamics in a minute. So also there's a lot of different ways that you can refer to people who experience violence. Survivor is a, or, when I think about um, people who cause harm, sorry, a lot of, sorry, there's a lot of ways that we could talk about people who cause harm, right? Sometimes you might know about them as abusers or abusive partners. And that's the term I'm gonna use throughout this presentation. Um, sometimes I refer to people as uh, people who cause harm. Perpetrators, again, is more legal language and um, is often used in the criminal and civil legal fields and Harm doers is a new, a newish term that we have used to really kind of de-gender and um, expand the ways in which we understand violence and harm. So, so harm doers is a more expansive term that folks have been identified and used. I hear it often um, in the transformative justice and restorative justice worlds um, because it's seen as a less stigmatizing um, practice or a less stigmatizing term. And then we also have batterers, again, more, um, a little bit more antiquated because it's primarily just focuses on the ways in which um, the physical connotation, connotations of domestic violence. And we know that it goes beyond that. So, um, and wife beaters, again, this one is also relatively antiquated um, and not everyone who is in relationships are married, uh, abusive relationships are, are wives. So we don't use that terminology. When we think about who is impacted by um, domestic violence, in the United States, you, I'm sure you might hear this stat a lot, 
one in three, a little bit more than one in three um, women. So about 35% of our population will report that they have experienced some type of physical violence, sexual violence, or um, stalking in their lifetime as a result or from an intimate partner. Now, the interesting thing is that in Kentucky, this number is a little bit closer to 45%, right? It's a little bit higher and it tells us a lot about who you might be seeing. When I think of, when we think about okay, if a little bit closer to half of the people have some type of history of domestic violence in their lifetime, it might mean um, might mean that there's something to look out for, something to name, something to, there's something to screen here, something to think about. And Indiana, I looked at the stats also in Indiana. Indiana is also higher than the national average, right? So again, one out of four people or one out of three um, or one every almost maybe one every two people that you talk about talk to and might have a history of domestic violence. Now the CDC collects data by gender, and so um, we're also going to look at how men are impacted. And that same number comes up: about one in three men have reported nationally that they have experienced intimate partner violence, either been um, stalked or experience physical aggression or sexual violence as a result um, by an intimate partner. Again, this number is a little bit higher in Kentucky and a little bit lower in Indiana. So it's still about one in three um, men will report they've experienced violence. Now, as we go through this, you can imagine that the impact of violence is, is really profound. And Many folks talk about needing medical care. And we'll talk a minute about how important the healthcare system is because the healthcare system and the police are the two um, critical first responders that we have uh, in the domestic violence, or two, uh, two keep survivors in this country. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So if someone's gonna need medical care as a result of um, experiencing physical violence, they're gonna need victim services. And this might be um, domestic violence shelters and hotlines and counselors um, and advocates, right? To help them move through and get access to services. Many survivors have reported post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress symptoms, which become very critical when we start thinking about the psychological health components of domestic violence, um, many survivors talk about, about 25% of survivors will talk about experiencing more severe forms of violence that have resulted in an injury, right? During their um, time in an abusive relationship. And they'll also talk about chronic pain. So if you see people coming in speaking about, I feel and I'm um, constantly in, really, I'm constantly in pain, things are really hurting, this might be a sign that they have some impact of domestic violence, some experience with domestic violence. I was thinking about what kinds of things you all would be more likely to see too. Um, and what we know is that survivors are more likely to report some of these symptoms compared to people who don't have histories of violence, right? So asthma, right? They also talk about irritable bowel syndrome could also be a impact of, or is an impact of violence that survivors ex experience more frequently than non-survivors. Diabetes, survivors have higher rates of diabetes, have higher blood pressure, and also more frequent headaches as a result. So these might be things that might be showing up for you as you do your work. Um, now, I have been taught in the community psychology field, one thing that I think becomes really critical as we start looking and thinking about social problems. The first is that how you frame a problem is how you're going, is how you see the solution, right? So these might be some common things that we hear. Oh, they're just fighting with each other. It's not, it's not a big thing. Uh, I don't really, or, I don't really like to get involved in the private business of couples. Like I'm just not, um, that's just not a thing that, you know, they'll work it out. It's just not a thing I like to get involved in. Or if we get involved, I mean, I'm not a relationship counselor. What do I do? 
Uh, or she must like it. I hear this sometimes and I get very confused because people might say, well, if she's been in it for so long, maybe, um, maybe she likes it. Maybe she's um, thinking about like, maybe she, that's just what she wants. I don't know. Um, or even he drinks a lot. So you might, um, people might talk about drugs or alcohol being a result of why he is so violent. Um, like he drinks a lot. So that's probably why he gets angry sometimes, right? And when I think about, if you're thinking about if in this way, if you, I'm sure if you've heard other ways that people have talked about violence and especially intimate partner violence, um, we know those as these very individual level attributions, right? When we identify domestic violence as solely focused on or the root cause being solely focused on these individual level experiences related to um, alcohol, individual um, experiences related to alcohol use or drug use or mutual couple conflict um, or someone not respecting another person. These are, I'm not saying that this is not present, but the truth is when you think about individual level attributions, you're gonna then think about, okay, well, if alcohol is the issue, then if we just put him in, um, if we just put him in a substance abuse treatment program, he'll stop abusing, right? And that's not the case, right? Because we know that not all people who use substances also use abusive tactics. And we also know that not all people who are abusive um, are folks who have addiction issues, right? So one of the things that stays the most consistent are more structural level attributions. So the idea is that if you think about domestic violence as rooted in power, if you understand that power in our society is unequally distributed across different social groups, right? That domestic violence then becomes a consequence of how power is constructed, particularly around gender, right, particularly around gender and what people have access to in terms of power, how power is created, how power is maintained, how power is reified and upheld by our social and material structures actually allow for abusive partners to continue to justify and maintain their abusive strategies. And so if we say, okay, if the reason why domestic violence, like domestic violence exists because we have inequitable access to, um, because of gender in inequality, then you are more likely to say, and we have um, people who are not men might have inequitable access to gender inequality um, or because there are social structures that are more rooted in, um, gender role ideologies about what it means to be a man or traditional masculinities, these types of things, you're more likely to, to not place blame on survivors. You're more likely to say, okay, what might be going on here? Again, that makes this person's world smaller. And how and in what ways can we increase the amount of power that this person has so that they can move through this particular relationship in a way that is best, most supportive to them? Because again, the structural attributions allows for us to understand domestic violence, the root of domestic violence as a power-based um, a power based experience, um, where again, one person has less power, one person has more. If we organize it in an individual level way, then that won't get us to um, a space where we can fully support and care for um, survivors. So, Okay, I just shared all of this with you. And so now the question is, how do we respond, right? All of these things are happening. Um, there's these types, you wanna start thinking about domestic violence as a way of power and thinking about that. Um, so what does it mean for us about response? And I'm gonna answer that question, but before I do, before you even think about what do I say to survivors? How do I understand survivors? You also wanna, you first, first wanna figure out how do we have the right environment here to create and support a survivor. If I find out, and how do we create a safe environment? What does that look like? The very first thing, if someone's coming to you or they wanna have a conversation or you wanna have a conversation with somebody, you really wanna ensure privacy, 
right? So you can pull them into an office if that's possible, pull them into a corner if you need to, if that's possible, if you're in a space where there's no private office or wait to see if you can have the conversation at a later point. Before you ask any questions connected to violence or asking people about violence, you wanna make sure that it's private, that it's confidential. What this also means is that you need to be aware of the confidentiality uh, the guidelines in your, in your system, right? If you're a mandated reporter, what does that mean for you about what you are able to, and you all, you all are because you're providers, but what does that mean for what you um, gonna, are gonna share or what you can share um, and what you might share outside of that relationship? So are outside of that conversation. So you wanna be really clear with that. So anytime you start a conversation or you wanna start screening, you move people to a more confidential place. You do not ask people, in, um, in public spaces. You also wanna make sure that the partner is not present, right? And there's lots of different ways that you can ask a partner to step outside the room. The next set of questions is gonna, you know, for example, the next set of questions that I'm gonna ask, it's, it's actually important that um, I can't allow for another person to um, be a part of this conversation. Can you step outside the room for a minute? It's a private conversation, this kind of thing. You can use your role as a healthcare provider to create more distance between the person and their partner. You also wanna be clear, do you have any standard operating procedures within your environment that would be helpful or useful to, as you think about next steps, if this person discloses to you that they had that they are experiencing violence. So what's in place at Norton that would allow for you to say, okay, I know, so I know my confidentiality um, requirements. I know what it is that um, I need to do. This is this particular screening tool we use. If you don't have a screening tool, that's okay. Um, there's even screening questions, like short questions we'll talk about now that allow, or we'll talk about in a minute um, that will help you decide how to um, move forward. So you wanna be super clear if there's standard operating procedures inside of the healthcare system that you're in to look at and to understand um, how to support a survivor. The next thing is to know a resource or the referral pathway. So where, what are you going to give the survivor as a result? And we'll talk a little bit about this, but it is really helpful. And I have some resources at the end, but it's gonna be really important for you before you have a conversation to say, okay, I'm aware of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Ideally, you'll also be aware um, of the Kentucky and the Indiana healthcare um, domestic violence um, coalitions. There's particular hotlines that are present. Every state has coalitions. Every coalition has member programs. And those member programs, again, can be shelters or legal services. So you wanna get connected and know about some of those services so that you can immediately give them to other, um, you can immediately give them to survivors. Now, one of the things that even though surviving is very, there's different components I just told you about with domestic violence. One of the things that we know for sure is that surviving is a very complex process. It's also a very dynamic process. And so one of the things that I um, wanna talk to you about is thinking about where a survivor might be on this, on their journey of disclosure and um, well-being and safety, right? If they disclose to you where they might be, um, or if they don't disclose to you where they might be. Because I also wanna name that disclosure in and of itself, your relationship with them, or your relationship with them is the goal, not necessarily disclosure if the survivor is not ready. We don't push for that. Um, but because surviving is so complex, the survivor might be at multiple different stages in her or in their process. The very first thing when somebody is surviving violence, we call it the um, appraisal stage. And this makes sense anytime we all figure out like, what do we wanna do? We're asking, what do we wanna do in life about anything? We're asking, is it a problem, right? Like, how do I define what is happening in my life right now? How do I think about it? That particular definition is influenced by who we are, our beliefs, our histories, our childhoods, what's around us, right? It's a very, problem definition is a very social construct because it allows for us to think about 
how we understand what it is that's an issue, right? What, so the survivor is thinking, is this a problem? Now for survivors, the problem, if they're the problem, if they are trying to think about the problem as domestic violence, most survivors, once the problem exceeds their ability to, or domestic violence becomes a problem when it exceeds their ability to individually cope on their own. Again, domestic violence oftentimes become a problem for most survivors when it exceeds their ability to cope on their own. Now, this is a really important thing to think about because at that point, they are gonna start making decisions. Like this is, I don't know how to handle this on my own anymore. And so I need to think about what I need in order to feel back in control, in order to create more um, space and opportunity for myself. So this component of needs appraisal, again, this is these two pieces. Survivors thinking about, is this a problem? Trying to define it as a problem and then thinking about what I need, right? What is it that will allow for me to get this, get this, address this problem? Do I need to go out? Do I need to go to my friends? Do I need to go to my family? Do I need to go if I'm still in connection with them? Do I need, because of isolation, it can be really difficult for survivors to have large networks um, where they can get access to the things that they need. So if they're thinking about, is it the problem and what do I need? They're then thinking about where can I go for help? And this point in the model where people are thinking about help seeking and seeking out support, one of the key components is that people look for and need what is available, what tends to be available in their environment, right? So they're gonna say, I need help with trying to divorce this person because we're married. And they're gonna be thinking about, okay, is there opportunities or ways like, I don't know how to do that. How can I do that? Can somebody help, you know, like, how can I find somebody to help me um, do this? They're going to be thinking about, so the available, what people need is rooted in their avail the availability of what is around them. If there is spaces or opportunities for people to get those needs met, they're going to be more likely to pursue. But if they're in places where there's no legal services available to them, or they feel like that's not available to them, if they're in spaces where there's not nearby hospitals, or um, where they think that if they call the police, the police won't come frequently, not think, they might know that I've called the police, I need immediate intervention support, but the police don't come in time. So that's not help that's available to me, right? The other piece is how people are treated. So once they've said, okay, this is a problem. They've gone through the problem appraisal stage. This is a problem. This is how I'm defining it. This is what I need. I'm thinking about who I wanna go to. And let's say I get there. This is a stage as I get there. And how the system, this is actually the most critical stage. This is the part where I study a lot. The most critical stage is how the system responds to survivors contributes to then whether survivors will go back to that system and see that system as helpful to them. So how you respond, how you connect with survivors, what you set up among survivors ends up being crucial to whether or not they are able to come back, whether they want to come back, whether they see you as a source for support for them um, moving forward. So even if they don't do a disclosure one time, right? Like even if they don't disclose when you immediately see them, if they see you as a safe person to come back to, someone who cares about them, someone who, who they know they can get some support from um, when they go through this process, they're gonna come back and they're gonna ask, they potentially might ask you um, for additional support. So being, this is why the relationship is more important than the disclosure because of how dynamic surviving is. Um, if you become a safe space for people, they are open and more willing to identify you as someone that they can reach out for to support, for support. Um, and then another thing which is different is are they a little bit different is when I went there, was it helpful, right? What happened? So they, if people were really kind to me, and I got resources that I needed, right? I was able to connect. I was able to establish a relationship. I don't feel as alone anymore. Um, and they, you know, I got connected to a social worker. I ended up being a part of a support group as a result of telling my provider about what was going on. That is survivors kind of moving forward and saying, okay, like I can do something. I can get help. I feel hopeful about this. 
And what is my life like now? So this is actually um, becomes really important. We think about longitudinal studies, about what is the long-term impact of having sought support from, from violence? What does that look like? Um, and what is the life like? So what are the outcomes of having disclosed to somebody? What happened to my, what happened to me? What, what went on? And survivors are going through this process in a secular way. They're moving back and forth um, between each of these stages. And at any point in time, if you feel, for example, if a survivor feels that they can't trust the system that they go to, then they might have to go back to well, is this even a problem if I can't get the help for it, right? Or what do I need? So this is a secular process that becomes really important when we think about the pro about help seeking and where we and where you all as healthcare providers can intervene. So let's talk about, is it a problem? If you're meeting somebody at this stage, is it a problem and what do they need? Again, the appraisal stage, is this a problem? I want you to pay attention to, um, are they making eye contact? There might be different, uh, signs like physical signs that allow for you to know like hmm, something might be going up here what's their eye contact like they might be you know I don't you know none of these are hard and fast they might be folks who just don't like eye contact and that's totally fine but are they looking down are they not really engaged with you when you start asking questions about their mental health or um, you're asking questions about their relationship right things might happen there might be a shift in subtle body language that I want you to be mindful of I also want you to be mindful of kind of hand placements are, you know, uh, there was a study that was done in 2022 where um, nurse providers were talking about how they kind of the subtle signs of noticing whether or not someone might have something going on. And they said, you know, I just noticed that the hand, they would be um, drooped down, the hands would be kind of lowered. They would, again, feel like I don't, I want to hide. I, I don't want to say these things. Some folks also think about fear responses, right? So when we think about someone who has PTSD, we're really talking about the ways in which um, thinking about someone who has hypervigilance, right? Who is very hypervigilant, someone who is really anxious. And these symptoms of PTSD might be connected to fear responses, which might be signs potentially of course, not always, but might be signs that you want to think about or ask about domestic violence. Now, questions like there's this, there's certain ambiguous questions, and I'm introducing this because it's not necessarily these are not bad questions, um, and they can be useful if you're trying to do a soft kind of introduction. But they are more ambiguous. Do you feel safe? Right. You might want to ask. So they come into your office, um, or they come into where you are and you're noticing some things, things feel weird. You have a partner, they have a partner who doesn't seem to leave them, want, want to leave them alone or um, things feel strange. So you might want to ask, do you feel safe? Um, are you safe at home? Do you feel safe at work? Do you feel safe in your neighborhood? Do you feel safe with the people you live with? Some people like to bridge this. Now, or even you can ask, how is your relationship, right? How is that for you? Now, these questions, again, are not bad and can be really important to leverage um, how we think about um, bridging with people in a soft way. But the problem is ambiguous questions can be kind of confusing. If you were to ask me if, if I feel safe, I'm not actually quite sure if you're talking about, like, do I have batteries in my, my smoke alarm? Yes. I do, you know, like, do you mean, like, what, when you talk about safety, what are you talking about? Like, of course, I guess I feel safe. Yeah, I like my neighborhood. Sometimes I have a, I don't have a door person on my front door, but like, it's fine. You know, like, there could be so many different ways that we think about how safety is interpreted. So if you're going to start with a, do you feel safe? You want to follow up with a more explicit question. I'll give you an example of that. But ambiguous questions can be a little bit more confusing or misinterpreted. There's also questions like, you might ask somebody, okay, and he treats you well, right? He's never threatened you or hurt you in any way. These are leading questions. Another one might be, and you all are getting along? Or how do you feel? So he, this seems good. Your relationship seems good, right? So these kinds of things are can, can be bridging, right? Like you might actually want to start with some kind of leading to soften the intro into having a conversation. But the problem is that leading questions 
can actually discourage disclosure. Um, they assume, they make assumptions about how it is that survivors might be feeling. And you could potentially with a leading question, shut down any type of experience that survivors might have wanted to share with you that might not be aligned with the assumption of the question that you just asked, okay? So what do we do? Disclosures, what we found out from recent studies is that the most disclosures happen from explicit questions about domestic violence. Um, and so if you're interested in thinking about, if you wanna encourage disclosure and create a space where people can feel like they are connected, at least in some way, or feel at least that they can share, you're giving them an open window. You're giving them some open space that is explicit. You're saying things like, have there been times when you have felt unsafe in your intimate relationship previously? Um, has your partner ever harmed you physically or sexually? Right? You're helping them also make a connection at this stage in the appraisal stage, if they're still trying to figure out like, is this a problem for me or what do I need? Your role can be to say, okay, let me help connect some of the symptoms that I'm seeing. You know, you're coming, you talk about chronic, chronic pain. You are having symptoms that didn't, I didn't, you know, I've been seeing you for five years and you've been having symptoms I've have never seen before. And I'm curious if you think that there might be a connection between your symptoms and your partner's behavior with X, right? So whatever that is, your job and the needs appraisal stage, again, the phase where they're talking about what they need, and what you need, uh, or trying to figure out what they need and if it's a problem, is to ask explicitly and provide space if that's what they're open to, or to help them make connections between what might be going on. What are some things we can also do um, that you can also set up that facilitate disclosure, and again, directly asking people about abuse, and really showing interest. Survivors say that they feel really, they feel more connected, they feel more open, they feel like they had a more positive experience with the disclosure process when the provider is showing interest in what they're saying and how they're saying it and what their story is. How do we show interest? Can you tell me more? I'm really, uh, you can say, Susie, I'm really interested in hearing more about this experience, right? These kinds of cues communicate to survivors that somebody is here and wants to know their story, wants to share. I told you earlier, disclosure is not necessarily the goal, right? The relationship is, the connection is. So you want to give survivors a choice to disclose, right? We open the door, maybe they, maybe they, uh, maybe they disclose, but maybe they don't. But they now, even you asking that explicit question, they know that you might be someone that they, if they, when they're ready, when they're out of kind of this needs assessment phase or this needs appraisal phase, you might be someone they can come back to. You know, last time you asked me if I'd ever been harmed in a relationship in my current relationship or experienced sexual violence or physical violence. And I want to say, I, you know, I wasn't ready last time, but now I am. And I want to tell you, yes, and this is what's going on in my life, right? So giving survivors a choice to disclose, not pushing for disclosure, but an opportunity is, is the best way. You wanna be competent and you wanna be comfortable. Survivors empirically have talked about, when I feel like my healthcare provider is really clear about, like they seem knowledgeable about domestic violence, they know what it is, they know that it's a pattern, they know that it's about control and they don't blame me for what's going on, I feel more comfortable sharing with them what's happening, right? Um, so when they feel like their provider is really comfortable with the dynamics, comfortable with sharing with them, comfortable with um, providing space, they're more likely to disclose. And also ensuring confidentiality. Of course, we don't, no one wants their business out in the streets, right? So when survivors feel like there might be a breach of my confidentiality here, um, then they're not going to tell you anything right, about their lives if they don't know where their information is going or they don't know whether or not you are going to be supportive of them. Some barriers to disclosure, survivors are very fearful about their children being taken away, right? So I want you to get really clear about what the mandated reporting um, guidelines in your system and your state are so that you can communicate ahead of time what might have, what might be showing up. Also provider um, judgment, right? They, survivors are really fearful when they feel like 
their folks are going to be judging them. Um, survivors don't want or worry about that possibility. They don't want to be judged by what's happening. None of us do, of course. They want to feel believed. So when they are not believed, that does not facilitate disclosure. And again, when there's a breach of confidentiality and lack of privacy, all of these things state that if you want survivors to feel connected, specifically deeply connected to what you're saying, you want to create a really safe, private, confidential space. There are some things, again, this is at the appraisal level. So there are some things that survivors will not, just might not be ready for. They might not describe the behaviors as abuse, right? I've worked with a lot of survivors who didn't even want to be called, you know, who didn't want to be called survivors and who was saying that their partners were not um, abusive. And we can still work together because I said, okay, how are in some ways that can we just create more wellness for you, create more health for you, create more comfort for you, create more care for you, right? Those are all still possible. So they might not be ready to appraise the abuse. They might not disclose because they're not ready to leave their abusive partner. Those dynamics um, are really entrenched. There's a lot of ways in which the partner has created and made a survivor's world smaller, right? So if they don't see possibilities, if they're not at the stage of like, who in my community can help me? How can I move forward? Um, then they're not gonna be ready to disclose because they're not ready to leave. They might be financially dependent on their partner or their partner has caused enough damage to their financial life, their credit cards, their credit scores, um, their rents, like these, their, their work, they don't have jobs, these kinds of things and end up becoming more financially dependent, which makes it hard to disclose because it might not feel like there's any way to go. And also they might not have people. They might not have a social support system. One of the things that we know as folks who support survivors is that the number one thing to keep people safe is their community. That's the number one thing. When people have community, when they have connection, they are more likely to feel empowered. They are more likely to be safe. They are more likely to feel have access to resources that they wouldn't normally have access to. If they don't have social support or people to support them in a way to move them forward, to progress them out, they're probably not gonna disclose violence. And so this piece about where do we go to for help also becomes really important, right? So we're past the problem, a problem appraisal phase. Survivors have said, this is a problem. And let's say you're meeting survivors at this stage, right? At the stage of where do I go to for help? And can I trust you? Again, we talked a little bit about how to create a trusting environment, but let's talk a little bit more, right? Again, you're non-judgmental. You're not um, the stereotype. So it's important, I think, to do individual reflection about what do you know? Um, of what have you been told about what domestic violence is? Are you making individual level attributions? Um, because if you're making individual level attributions about violence and the causes of violence, then the likelihood that you're gonna engage in more self and, and more um, survivor blame strategies is higher because why doesn't she just Da, 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 right? Whatever it is that you think survivors should do, leave, get a new job, um, leave her partner, uh, take her kids out of that situation. These kinds of things um, can make it really difficult. You need to be empathetic, right? Trust begins with empathy. I can't imagine what it'd be like to be in this person's situation, right? It would be hard, or maybe you can, right? Maybe you're a survivor yourself, so you know how hard it is for people to try to move through and be healthy and connected after being in an abusive relationship. I want you to use a lot of validating language and to support um, the experiences and, the val and validate how survivors are moving through. You also wanna acknowledge that IPV is wrong. And I think this sometimes, this might feel like a, oh, like, of course it's wrong. Of course nobody, or domestic violence, of course domestic violence is wrong. Um, but explicitly saying that can be really, really useful um, for to name or to cue. We talked about cues earlier, right? To cue to survivors that you're a person that's safe, right? I don't think it's fair, you know, like, I don't think you deserve that treatment. I don't think any, I think everybody deserves to be in healthy relationships is the kind of thing that you can say. Um, and to take care of the whole person. When people or providers or survivors are engaging with providers, they're talking about the ways in which the trust is built because they felt like the provider saw their whole person, really cared about them as a whole human being, right? Those kinds of things are important. And they wanted somebody, trust, 
um, really builds with being knowledgeable about CV, feeling that the provider knew a little bit, right? Knew a little bit, at least a little bit about what's going on with violence. So some questions um, that you might ask, or if you're at this stage or you're feeling the survivor is saying like, yes, I've experienced this. Um, what are some what you can, or you feel like, yeah, there's, there's, there's some appraisal that this is a problem, that domestic violence is a problem. You can use normalizing statements or provide some context to the problem. So you might add some affirmations. So you might say, you know, I find that answers to the next couple of questions I'm gonna ask you are really common. Um, in our state, about 35% of people will say yes, that they have had this experience. So have you ever been sexually or physically abused by a partner in your lifetime, right? This might be a way to normalize. Um, these practices. Another way you might affirm or offer, if someone's telling you a story, offer affirmations. Everyone deserves to feel safe in their relationships. Your health is really important to me. Your safety is really important to me. You can say things like, I actually don't believe that abuse is acceptable for in any reason, for any circumstance. Or you can say, I appreciate all that you're doing to keep yourself and your children safe. They, survivors say that a trusting environment is not built when folks feel cold or disinterested, when providers lack compassion or are really visibly uncomfortable about asking them questions, or they lack knowledge or skills, right? Or the only focus on physical injuries. None of these things really support or build trust. Now, the last bit, because you're connected to or create um, this opportunity to have relationships and connections with providers. It is also, or with survivors, it is also your job to document, document, document what you can, right? So if you're seeing signs, if you're seeing symptoms, um, you wanna disclose, if you can disclose in writing or you take photographs if necessary, um, or if you can. Um, again, we're not pushing for disclosure, but if there is, write it down. Um, medical records might be the thing, medical records or Notes might be the thing that survivors can use to make cases should they pursue um, legal um, legal pursuit or should they pursue legal action. Um, and so it becomes really important for the document things to be documented in some way. So please, if you can, I mean, obviously you'll need to, but please document and document clearly and thoroughly. But I don't necessarily want you to push for disclosure at any point because the relationship is more important. Now this last bit about were they helpful? We know at some point that safety planning is one of the key components and the key responses, the key immediate responses to domestic violence for survivors. So even asking a few questions about um, how people plan to keep themselves safe can be really supportive and helpful for survivors. And so when we talk about safety planning, we're talking about um, actions that the survivors develop to reduce the risk of being harmed by a partner. It's not, per it's not perfect, but it allows for us to have some intention about how we're moving through and connecting with survivors. The first thing you might wanna ask people is about who are your safe people? I'm getting, this is categories because there's lots of different ways that you might ask questions like this. Who are your safe people? Who's in your networks? Who can you go to for support if things get really bad at home, right? Um, who can you text like a code word and say pickles, right? And that person will know to call the police or to try to come over, right? If that's necessary. Who are the people at work that can help you? If survivors are saying, I'm not, I don't actually have a ton of people in my immediate network. Um, but you can talk about work colleagues that folks might trust or that they might trust to support them or to show up for them. Um, and who can you call to pick you up? Is there anyone um, who might be available or able to come and, and be with you or to come get you quickly if that's necessary? So the category of like, who are your safe people is a really component, important component when we think about um, doing safety plans with survivors. Another component is where are your safe spaces, right? Is there a public place? If you plan to end your relationship and you're worried about the harm, can you end it in a public place? Is there a public space that you can go to in an emergency, right? A public space where um, folks can be support, you know, 
folks can see you, you know, you can be seen, things can happen in a way um, where it's not in the private, the private of the home. Is there a way that you can um, go somewhere in, an, in the case of an emergency? And people might have lots of different um, ideas about this, but where are your safe spaces is really critical that the, the abusive partner may not know about. It's also a third category is thinking about what are your safe items, right? Um, if you need to leave quickly, do you have copies of your IDs or passports, important health documents, things for your children if you have them? Um, what are some things that you might need to pick up? You can take really easily um, if you need to leave your house immediately, right? Where are they? Where are all those pieces? Do you have hidden cash somewhere that your partner doesn't know about? Um, a different kind of cash that's put somewhere so that, again, if you need to leave quickly or if something happens, you're able to attend to. If something happens financially, you're able to attend to that. The other thing, especially now when we start thinking about um, a digital abuse or abuse that takes place um, in different, using different technologies, um, how does your partner have access to your phone and to your passwords? Are there ways that we can get you other, um, are there other strategies that we can use um, outside of your social media accounts? I don't know if your partner is monitoring that. Um, or, or your phone, or do your partners have access to this? Can you create different kinds of accounts that your partner might not have access to? Um, do your friends have access to your accounts if something happened or if they needed to reach you could, or if they needed to access some information, do you have friends that you trust that could get to some of your information? Another thing is, um, have you sent private photos to abusive partners that we need to be mindful of that might be used in retali retaliation? Um, it's just important to think about and know these types of things. And then the last category is planning for children, right? So you wanna ask folks, do your children know how to call 911 if necessary, if that's um, what you wanna do? Does your code, do you have a code that you, again, maybe pickles might be it. Is there a code that you can use um, for or to ensure uh, or to communicate to your kids that it's that they need to call 911 and they need to get help? Um, and is there a safe place that your children can go if they need to be safe? So these kinds of things, making a plan or talking through, if you have space, you know, obviously they, everybody has different amounts of time that's available, but these are the kinds of practices that can be really important. And this is the last bit that I wanna share. Um, the most important thing that we can do is to refer and resource. Right, refer and resource. If you are someone who um, is trying to figure out, well, how do I support and what does this look like? Um, you might say something like, I really appreciate you sharing the story with me. I'm care, I care and I'm concerned about your safety and the safety of your child or children. I can connect you with some counseling and some support and some resources and potentially a shelter if that's what you're interested in. Everything is free and confidential. Would you be interested, right? Making that bridge to the different resources can be really critical. Um, one of the things that empirically we know is that when a survivor is able to get to a warm handoff, right? If you're, you as a provider are giving a warm handoff to someone that's ideally on site, an on site social worker, family social worker, hospital social worker, an on site IPV advocate, someone who's specifically in the hospital to provide intensive care support advocacy for people who are experiencing violence. If not, you might wanna give a resource to, um, to a community, a local community organization. If you can, having somebody knowing or making a connection to someone at the organization, so you can say, you know, I know a person named Marsha who um, works at this organization that specifically works with people who've had similar experiences with you, would you be interested if I give you her number so you can call her, right? Even having a number instead of saying, you can call this resource, having a number, having a name can really humanize the resource and increase the possibility that the survivor uses it. Um, and any kind of community organization in general, if you're finding that there's other things connected that the survivor might be interested in, like housing or legal services, um, these are two numbers that I wanted to share with you. These are two resources. Both of these, um, the Kentucky Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence, these are their numbers. The slide, these slides are available, so you'll have them. 
Um, they both, again, coalitions have a set of member programs. And so member programs are, again, all of the programs connected to domestic violence within the state. So you, um, if you call the coalition, they should be able to give you access or even go to the website. They should give you access to the types of services that are available in your state. And the last bit, this part about where, where my life is now, we actually have the least amount of information about longitudinal impact of domestic violence, um, and particularly after disclosures are getting help. And so some of the negative consequences if someone has disclosed is that there's no change in their life. So they've sought help, they've engaged with people, and they don't feel like anything has shifted, right? Or they feel blamed, they feel like, after having gone through the system multiple times or having talked to somebody, um, they feel like the system is reifying um, the fact that they are that they should that they are the ones to blame. They might feel helpless, like I've done this. This is so hard, um, and no one. It's so hard to find help and support. Or they might be more fearful because of retaliatory violence if the partner has found out that they're trying to seek support outside of the relationship, um, and that could increase danger that they might be in. Positively though, some disclosures have led to survivors feeling validated and feeling like I've reached a turning point. This particular interaction, these interactions, this connection that I have, these relationships make me feel like there is a different way to move in my life, right? I feel optimistic, I feel hopeful. I feel like things can shift for me. I know that I'm not to blame for this relationship. These are the kinds of um, outcomes that we really want for survivors. And so also know that there are supports available for them, that they live in a world and they, they are engaged in systems where there are people, there are systems, there are supports available that can meet their needs, right? And that their life is better off for it. So the last bit, this is the very last slide I have um, for you. When we think about how do you respond, um, assess or ask, validate what the survivor is experiencing, document what it is that the survivor is identifying or naming or has disclosed to you. And the most important thing is to refer and resource. Screening is, um, screening is not actually, doesn't, hasn't been shown to result in a reduction of violence, but it does, screening and assessing does necessarily result in an increase in referrals and resources to communities. So that's really um, why we assess is to connect people to the kinds of resources that they need to make their life well. All right, thank you. Dr. Nkiru Navulezi, so appreciate your content and what you've described for us for these patients that are suffering from intimate partner violence. Um, I know we were going to uh, ask some questions and go through a couple of cases if you have enough time for that. We only have two questions in the chat. This is from um, Adderine. I know you said it was higher in Kentucky, which is a red flag for me. What are these numbers per capita? Yeah, they were. So they're based off of the, um, I got the numbers from, this is a great question too. I got the numbers from the Centers for Disease Control, the National Intimate Partner Violence and Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. And so they are, um, what I know, yes, they are. Um, but I'm also happy to drop the report in the link if you're interested in knowing, because there are a lot of different, um, they break it down more than I, than I did talking about the rates of psychological aggression, um, stalking, sexual violence, that kind of thing. So I'm happy to drop the report in um, or give you the citation if you're interested in looking at a little bit more. And state level statistics can be really hard to find. I don't know if you all find this, but can be actually pretty hard to find in a way that um, can be like cohesive and conducive. So this is like the best available data that I know about Kentucky and Indiana. Thank you. And and again, from Adarine, she works in the juvenile justice system, and she's wondering, are these only adult numbers? Yes, they are, because truly, I feel like the juvenile um, legal system is extreme. I mean, all of these systems are extremely complicated, but um, that's a whole, I feel like that's a whole other training, a whole day training to talk about youth and um, 
aggression, use and youth and violence. Um, so yes, they are, this is all adults. And, and again, great information. Thank you so much for your time today and such a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. And we're gonna move on to our, our next speaker now, Dr. Mona Thank Lisa Taylor. I had a couple of cases that we were putting together to kind of help reemphasize the importance of um, discussing these issues with our patient. So some of these are inspired from real patient cases that we've seen in, even in our clinics. So the first one is a 53 year old female coming in for a follow up appointment after a fall. She states that her fall was about two weeks ago, but she's not been able to come in for an appointment. She has a headache. She notes that she's got neck pain and her throat hurts and she doesn't remember her fall and can't share any more details. She gets really tearful once you ask her more questions. So I know in our presentation, we've seen um, the importance of making sure that our patients feel heard and feel like they have a safe place. Um, and especially with the fall and with the neck discomfort, one of the main symptoms that you, or one of the main things that you see with folks that have intimate partner violence could be strangulation. Um, so that is something that you want to keep in mind um, since that could be contributing to some of the patient symptoms. Again, the most important thing is going to be making sure that the patient has a safe place where they feel like they can share what happened. And creating that trust is so very important to how you can address this conversation with the patient and get them the resources that they need. But of course, also keeping in mind that we need to get them the medical care as well to help address the fall, the injury to the neck, um, and what happened to her two weeks ago. So I hope that makes sense. Our next case um, is actually a case uh, from a few weeks ago. So it was a 42-year-old female who came in for an urgent appointment for abdominal pain. She's emotional, she's clutching her abdomen during the appointment, and she appears nervous and uncomfortable. So from her interview, she actually ended up disclosing to the physician that her ex-partner showed up at her home the night before and threw her to the ground. She couldn't remember what happened, she had blacked out, and she knows that her kids were there and she wasn't feeling well today, which is why she came in to be seen. Um, and so this was a harder conversation for the physician um, in the sense of, we've got these urgent medical issues that were going on for the patient with the abdominal pain, with the knee being hurt and uncomfortable and the patient blacking out. So again, creating that trust, being non-judgmental, trying to create a safe place for the patient was very important. Um, also getting the patient evaluated for these different complaints was also the next most important thing because she doesn't remember what happened. She was kicked to the floor. She was blacking, she blacked out. She may need some imaging of her head, her abdomen and of her knee uh, to get a better idea of what happened. And again, connecting her with those resources is so important. So those phone numbers that um, Dr. Onkiru Nawulezi shared with us is going to be so important. The Kentucky Coalition Against Domestic Violence or Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence, that's gonna be really important. And making sure that we've got follow-up for this patient, that's a bit quicker than what we would normally see, but given the urgent issue, getting them in in one to two weeks, again, to just to reevaluate what's going on, make sure they're doing okay from a physical standpoint, but also from a mental health standpoint. It's gonna be very important. And as we noticed in our presentation, these folks are at higher risk of other chronic medical issues that would also impact their um, ability to take care of themselves or their children. Um, because of how much of a mental toll that this can take on that patient. So 
just a few things to keep in mind. Our next patient case is a 78 year old female and she had remarried three years ago. She comes in for her follow-up appointment and she discloses that her husband is jealous and paranoid. She likes to have lunches and meet friends but states her husband is constantly worried that she's meeting other men. She states that her husband calls all the time and she can handle his behavior because, quote, you know how men are, but she can't outrun a bullet. This one's a bit more emotional in terms of the type of abuse the patient is facing. Um, there's a lot of controlling behaviors that are occurring between the patient and her new husband. Um, he's trying to monitor where she's going. He's calling her constantly to ask what's going on. And there seems to be a inherent jealousy between the patient and the husband. Um, the part that was concerning, obviously, is that she reemphasized she can't outrun a bullet. Um, and again, the importance of creating that safe space, trying to talk to the patient about what resources we can connect her with is so important. But also what Dr. Ankiru Nalvulezi reemphasized is identifying those safe people. Who's in her network? Who can she contact as a support system um, in case something should happen? Because that concern for the violence is real uh, based on what the patient is sharing. So is there someone at school? Is there someone within the family? Is there someone that she can text to say, here's this concern I have, can you come help me? Um, this is also important to identify the safe places that patient could feel like they could go if something does happen. Um, that is going to be very, very important along with the advocates that we have in trying to make sure that the patient knows that you're available as a resource if something should happen. So very, very important um, to keep this in mind, especially when some of that physical violence is not there, it might be more emotional violence that's happening uh, between the patient and their partner. And then our last case is a 35-year-old male presenting for an appointment to his primary care. He's nervous and he wants to talk about his mental health. His self-esteem has been low and he's been criticized by his partner whenever he feels like he's not able to do anything right. He's had a hard time sleeping and a hard time around the house anytime he does a task because he's yelled at and criticized. So with this patient case, we're seeing a male present for concerns for new mental health issues and a concern for how his partner is going to react. So very important for us to keep in mind that intimate partner violence can happen for women, but it can also happen to men as well. I think it was one in four cases uh, end up being for males. And a lot of times it might be more of this emotional abuse and criticism that occurs on a very regular basis, which can be hampering to the patient's quality of life. And so it's going to be really important, again, to create that safe place for the patient and be able to recognize like that this can happen to both genders equally. So that way you can make sure this patient feels heard that way you can make sure this patient gets connected to those resources that we discussed in today's lecture as well. So this is another patient who would benefit from having that quicker follow-up, making sure that they have those resources on board and to have a reevaluation on how things are going. So I hope those cases are helpful. I hope this presentation today has helped you better tackle some of these issues that do come up with our patients in the clinic setting. And we're gonna continue talking about that here in a little bit.
Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go back and just uh, honor you a bit and tell you how grateful and blessed we are to have you in, in the community. Dr. Taylor is a graduate of the University of Louisville School of Medicine, where she also completed her residency in internal medicine. Today, she practices with our Norton Community Medical Associates. She currently serves as the Executive Medical Director for Primary Care at Norton Medical Group and as the President of the Kentucky Medical Association. Dr. Taylor is both the youngest and first female president of color in the history of the association. She's a graduate of the Norton Provider Leadership Academy, the Leadership Louisville Program, and Ignite Louisville. Thank you so much for bringing us your expertise today, Dr. Taylor.